The next uh, part of our program is really exciting. Um, we have a special presenter to bring to you. Um, we've wanted to have her as part of the conference for several years now, and we're so grateful that she took time out of her very busy schedule to be with us today. Um, and it is Shirley Lung. It is my pleasure to introduce her. Hi, Shirley. Um, Hello. <laughs> so I'm going to give a little bit about your background um, and your impressive bio, and then I'm going to hand it over to you. We're all uh, really excited to have you with us um, and speaking here today. Um, Shirley Long is a columnist and associate editor at the Boston Globe. She's written on everything from the intersection of business and politics to gender and diversity issues in the workplace. She has been a three-time finalist for the Gerald Loeb Award for Commentary. In 2018, Boston Magazine named her to its list of the 100 most influential people in Boston. Shirley is also a contributor to GBH's Boston Public Radio and Greater Boston. I've seen her on those shows, she's fantastic, as well as a regular guest on New England Cable News. She's also been the Globe's business editor, where she oversaw its award-winning coverage of the 2008 financial crisis. Prior to the Globe, Shirley was a staff reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, most recently, due to the uh, rise in anti-Asian violence, Shirley has been in high demand for speaking engagements uh, because she's such a big thinker and she provides us with such critically important insights and information. Um, we're so grateful, Shirley, to have you here with us today. Uh, thanks so much. And um, I will turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Amy. And um, thank you, Mael, wherever you are on the screen. I think I see you a little bit um, for the energy both of you put into organizing this conference. Um, so since I launched my column in 2013, I consider women lawyers among my most loyal readers. Uh, and you are my base. <laughs> I, I, I've spoken uh, to quite a few groups of women lawyers and events through the years. So thank you for subscribing, reading and following my work. Um, so I wanted to talk about so many things today and I actually wrote two speeches, um, but don't worry, I'm not gonna deliver both of them. Uh, <laughs> I'm only gonna talk about, I'm only gonna deliver one today, but in the Q and A, maybe someone should ask me about whether I have some thoughts about the future of women in the workplace, okay? Um, so what I really wanted to focus my remarks on um, is what it means to be Asian American in this moment. I get asked this question a lot. Um, you know, amid a rise in anti-Asian hate, how is life different? Um, and so for me, life began to change in January uh, when an 84-year-old Thai immigrant was shoved to the ground um, outside his home in San Francisco, and he later died. Um, this, like so many attacks um, on elderly Asian Americans, was caught on video and it went viral. So that's when I started to hound <laughs> my widowed mother, uh, who's in her 70s, who lives in the Bay Area. You know, a lot of these incidences have been happening in California. And um, I tell her, never go out alone. You know, I also have a mother-in-law uh, in LA. You know, I, I tell my husband, tell your mom to be really careful when she leaves the home. And when I talk to my mom, you know, I, you know, probably every other time I talked to her is like, you know, be safe. And um, after a while, my mom uh, has told me, don't worry, I don't even venture into Chinatown anymore in Oakland. Um, and in Chinese, she would say, and that the literal translation is, I'm scared to death. So don't worry, I'm going to be, I'm going to be careful. But what shook me to the core um, and I think for a lot of Asian Americans was the mass shooting of, uh, in Atlanta, um, on March 16th, eight lives were lost, including, um, six Asian American women. Um, and for the first time in my life, I live with fear for my, my myself, um, for my children, for my elderly mother, for my mother-in-law, my aunties, my Asian friends. Um, because at that moment, I didn't know if the shooting 
was the apex, the, the culmination of a year-long wave of anti-Asian sentiment? Or was it the beginning of an even more violent and dangerous period for Asian Americans? And a week after the Atlanta mass shooting, um, there was another shooting, another mass shooting at a Colorado grocery store. And I remember thinking to myself when I saw the first headline, please don't let it be any more Asian American victims. You know, I, I just, and I don't think there were any Asian American victims, um, but I, you know, I, I was like, please, I, I can't, I can't deal with it if it is. Um, but then a month later in April, there was another mass shooting at a FedEx facility in Indiana. Four of the eight victims were Sikh you know, another Asian American group. And I, I think various groups, Atlanta has been now classified as a hate crime. I, I'm not sure the status of the Indiana incident, but there's a lot of concern in the Asian American community. So since Atlanta, I have started to think about, I started to think twice about taking walks alone outside. I live in a leafy suburb. Um, and I also worry about venturing out after dusk. Um, I try to always have the dog with me. She's part Sharpei. Originally, you know, the Sharpei is originally bred by the Chinese to guard the royal palace. So I always feel safe with her. Um, I make sure I'm not glued to my phone um, when I'm out and about, you know, taking those walks um, with the dog. Um, I'm always aware of my surroundings. Um, eyes up always was the advice another Asian American gave me. So I thought it was um, just me being overly sensitive, um, but I recently read how Hawaii Senator Maisie Hirono spoke about her own fear of violence and how she no longer feels comfortable walking while listening to an audiobook on her headphones. This fear simmers inside me. Um, in April, I was invited to speak at um, an Asian American solidarity, solidarity rally in Quincy. Um, it was outside uh, Quincy City Hall. It was on a, like a warm, sunny, beautiful day, uh, much like today. And, um, you know, normally I would get butterflies before public speaking, right? Uh, kind of like I had a, you know, a few butterflies today uh, before giving this talk. And, um, uh, but that morning of the rally, I got butterflies for a different reason. Um, I was thinking about the worst case scenario. What if I get shot? You know, I've, I've had problems with trolls on Twitter who have tried to confront me in person and the Globe has provided a security consult whenever I need one. And I was kicking myself that I didn't ask our security team to check in with the rally organizer beforehand. Um, I mean, obviously I didn't get shot. I, I'm still alive. <laughs> I'm, I'm here speaking to you today. Um, this is not some virtual recording from the other side. Um, and, um, and, and that day I did notice a visible police presence at the police presence at the rally and, and, I, and I felt safe. Um, and so perhaps you may think I was being, you know, again, overly sensitive or hyperbolic, um, but you know what? <laughs> the very first speaker at the rally that day was a Filipina pastor. And she also talked about her new fear of being shot. After Atlanta, she was shopping at 99 Ranch. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to 99 Ranch, but it's this giant, beautiful Asian grocery store in, um, in, in Quincy. And it's, it's part of a big chain based out of California. And this is one of their first outposts in Massachusetts. Anyways, 99 Ranch is usually her happy place. The place she goes and shops for ingredients to make her Filipina dishes. And, but when she was shopping, she began thinking, what if a mass shooting took place here? What would she do 
if she were there with her one-year-old. So right after the Atlanta murders, um, I interviewed one of your own, uh, Vivian Singh, a 69-year-old corporate uh, lawyer from Concord. Uh, she's Chinese American, um, and she had a completely different response than me or any, well, anyone else I know. She decided to learn how to shoot a gun. Like many Asian Americans, Vivian had been feeling invisible and helpless after a year seeing a rise in Asian hate crimes and violence. Vivian told me she was driven to the shooting range by rage and a sense of aloneness. And by the idea of, if I don't do something for myself, nobody is going to save me. So what's also been different for me um, is talking to my sons who are eight and 10. Um, I've had to give them um, the Asian version of the talk. Um, that is something black families have long given to their children on how to act when stopped by the police. You know, hands out of the pocket, no sudden moves, do what they say. Um, the Asian version, and, and it's something many Asian Americans are learning to do for the first time, uh, is about talking to their loved ones about um, harassment, bullying, and violence, uh, how to protect themselves um, from this kind of hate. Um, you know, for many Asian Americans, um, we are not only giving the talk to our young kids, um, but also to our elderly parents, um, telling them to be careful when they venture out, or in some cases, arming them with pepper spray, or um, one other idea or strategy, if you will, I keep hearing is, um, you know, stay masked, um, you know, wear sunglasses, wear a hat, try as much as possible to hide your Asian-ness. Um, and, and, you know, I, ke I kept on hearing that advice over and over again from people. Um, for me, it was much easier to talk to my son, my mother. Uh, it was easier to give her the talk. Um, but my sons, I, I struggled mightily. Um, not only was it difficult to find the right words, and, and I write for a living, but I was so full of anger. How has it come to this? You know, or, or, or maybe I just, you know, I, I procrastinated quite a bit um, before I talked to them. And, and maybe I just wanted to protect them just a little bit longer from a not so kind world they are about to grow up in. Um, and so when I gave my talk to the eight-year-old, I mean, he didn't realize with his black hair and light yellow skin um, that he is different. Um, I mean, his first question was, what is Asian? And, um, you know, I kept the talk simple to both my kids. Um, you know, I said, you know, sometimes people will treat you differently based on the color of your skin or your heritage and how it's okay to talk to mommy and daddy about it and to know it's not their fault when someone makes fun of them or bullies them. Um, I know some of the talk sunk in because now the eight-year-old knows he is Asian. Um, he has been watching music videos by the K-pop, by the K-pop Korean boy band, BTS. And, um, you know, so my husband's Korean American and um, so our kids are half Chinese, half Korean. And um, so the eight-year-old asked me recently, when I grow up, will I look like BTS? So he, he does see himself now <laughs> as Asian. And anyways, um, uh, but if we wanna create a more equitable society, it just can't be black and Asian parents delivering the talk. You know, to truly stop this vicious cycle of hate, white parents need to do their part and have 
the kind of uncomfortable conversations that can root out racism before it grows into violent acts of hate. Um, I was, I've been working on a story about um, the one year, one year anniversary of the George Floyd murder and the racial reckoning that this com country has gone through. And um, I was talking to a company yesterday um, and, and like many companies, they began holding town halls on race after the murder of George Floyd. And, uh, and, and it's been a time for black employees to open up and share their experiences. Um, so after one of these town halls, you know, everyone's doing them virtually, um, a white employee, you know, you know, walked downstairs from his office to his kitchen table, so to speak, and, and decided, was so moved by his colleagues' stories that he decided to have uncomfortable conversations with his white family, with his sons. And, um, and, and, and his, you know, his sons, and then his college-age daughter also, you know, started listening to her father and the stories and the conversations that he was telling about what from these town hall, hall halls. And um, after listening to her father's talk, she began to look at her own circle and realized her sorority wasn't diverse. So she's now doing something about it. So this is how we reverse racism in America. One by one, family by family. I mean, there's no easy fix and we all have to do the work. Um, so what's also different for me is realizing just how invisible Asian Americans are in society. Consider this, prominent Asian Americans have been you know, hard to ignore over the past year. We have Kamala Harris. She became the, not only the first woman to serve as vice president, but also the first black person and the first Asian American. I mean, it was almost in all the stories, right? Um, Andrew Yang, fresh off uh, a 2020 White House run, is now among the front runners in the New York City uh, mayoral race. Um, you know, with Symphony Halls closed everywhere, cellist Yo-Yo Ma has become a social media star. I mean, he's playing and sharing his music on, on Twitter and elsewhere. Um, yet in a recent online survey uh, of about 2,700 American adults, uh, in which participants were asked to name a well-known Asian American, the most common answer was, don't know. 42% don't know. The, and then the next, <laughs> followed by Jackie Chan, 11%. And then Bruce Lee, 9%. Um, and I just, was shocked by these results. I mean, I was like, let me get this straight. So when Americans think of Asian Americans, um, they think of an Asian aging martial arts movie star. Uh, I don't, I can't remember last time Jackie Chan was in a movie and he's not even American, he's from Hong Kong. And, um, you know, Bruce Lee is a martial arts legend, but he's been dead for nearly 50 years. So I, I wrote a column about this with, with a big ask, which is my fellow Americans crawl out of your closet of ignorance. I mean, I, I, when I wrote this column and, and the results of the survey, I had readers trying to convince me that this is not about ignorance. Um, excuse number one, people don't consider Indian Americans as Asian Americans. So that's why people scored poorly. That's why they couldn't answer the questions, surely. I was like, okay. And then number two excuse, um, not everyone sees skin color. They just see you. I mean, like I see you, I don't see you as Asian, surely. I see you as a good journalist. Uh, Kamala Harris is the vice president, period. Um, Andrew Yang is a political candidate, period. Yo-Yo Ma is a talented musician, period. And um, I I've heard this argument before, and um, but I've never known how to respond. So I asked around, <laughs> and here's what I, I, I should say. 
Uh, and, and I actually was thinking, oh, I still have to write, I still have to send that reader an email with this response, which is, um, so what I should be saying to people when I get this response is, I know what you're trying to say, but if you don't see my color, you don't see me. Um, so if you haven't guessed by now, one of the most offensive things you can do to render an Asian American, do to an Asian American is to render um, them invisible, render uh, their issues, their achievements invisible. And um, one of the things I'm wrestling with and is, you know, right after the Floyd murder um, and the national protests that followed, you know, I got calls from my bosses, you know, you, you've been writing about diversity for years and, and, you know, race for years. So we need to step up and lean in on coverage of Black Lives Matter. Um, and I was like, yep, I'm going to do it. It's a really important issue. Yes, I am going to step up. I never got that same call after Atlanta. I was the one who had to call my bosses and say, hey, um, we really should be covering uh, the AAPI community uh, a lot more now. Th this, this is a turning point for this community, for my community. Um, and I want you to think about your own organization or own organizations. Did that also happen? You know, how different was the response to Floyd compared to stop AAPI hate? So on a recent, um, we, uh, I had I, on a recent front page graphic, you know, about the Boston mayoral race, um, the Globe ran short biographies of the six uh, major mayoral candidates. Uh, Andrea Campbell and Kim Janey, uh, both were described as former city council presidents, but not Michelle Wu, uh, who was the first woman of color to serve as city council president. Instead, we highlighted how she had an internship at City Hall. I mean, there was only three bullet points and one of the, you know, did not mention, we mentioned her city councilor and then we mentioned her internship, but we didn't mention that she served on the, she was, she had this, you know, barrier breaking moment as the first woman of color as, as city council president. Um, no editor or reporter caught that omission before it went into the paper. I mean, how does that happen? You know, was it a simple error or unconscious bias? I mean, I moderated a panel yesterday on Asian Americans in sports. Um, Eugene Chung is a former first round draft pick for the Patriots who later became an assistant coach for the Chiefs and the Eagles. Um, he spoke about how he aspires to be um, to become the first Asian American head coach in the NFL. He was interviewing for a coaching job recently. And during the interview, he was told he checked all the boxes except for one. He's not considered a minority. So Eugene's a Korean American and he was dumbstruck. I mean, as you can imagine, um, he thought to himself, Last I checked in the mirror, I am a minority. So Eugene talked about being, quote, emotionally paralyzed, end quote, after, you know, after this response during the interview. And um, given the rise in anti-Asian sentiment, given the moment we're in, he couldn't help himself but to say something to the interviewer at that moment. Um, at the risk of losing out on the job, which he did not get, and maybe was for the better. You know, why would you work for an organization that doesn't consider Asian Americans a minority? Anyways, this really stuck with him. And, you know, I was also incredulous this still happens. And, I mean, said to an Asian American's face, you are not a minority, with, in, with a straight face. That is pretty incredible. Not, and, and I just remember 
when Eugene was telling me this story and, and at this webinar we were doing, um, you know, I kept asking Eugene, this, this happened in 2021? And he says, yes, it did. Um, the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation, you know, I, I wrote a, recently, actually this week, <laughs> issued a 29 page report on closing the racial wealth gap. And um, their findings, if the state could eliminate inequities in the black and brown communities, like increasing um, the rate of college graduation and high school graduations, if, if the rate was the same as white peers, for example, the Commonwealth could add about $25 billion uh, to its economy over five years or the equivalent of about 100,000 jobs. Um, I mean, that's, that's, a, you know, that's a really big deal. Um, and that is something, you know, it, it will can focus everyone on trying to close these inequities um, in the black and brown communities. But the analysis did not include Asian Americans at all. You know, we just need to look at the brown, we don't need to worry about Asians. Again, model minority hangs over our heads. And, and I said something to, <laughs> I said, I almost didn't want to do the story, but I, I, I decided I, I'm going to do the story because it's important. And then I'm going to have an asterisk explaining how this report did not include Asian American data. Um, and because, you know, I've seen the data about disparities in the Asian American community. Yes, Asian Americans make up some of the wealthiest households in this country, but they also are some of the poorest. And um, we are not a monolith. And some of us have been here for generations. You know, others are undocumented immigrants. Um, some go to Harvard, others struggle to finish high school. Um, and once you see the data on Asian American disparities, you can't unsee them. I mean, consider this, Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial group in greater Boston and account for about 8.9% of the population. That's about the same size as the black population in greater Boston. The Asian American poverty rate in Boston is about 29%. It's a few percentage points higher than black households and nearly three times higher than white households. Yet why do policy makers ignore these numbers? It, I mean, it's as if someone decided only one community of color can be helped at any given time. What's not different, and I'm almost done here. <laughs> it, what's not different is that anti-Asian sentiment and violence has been around for decades. I mean, consider that the worst periods for Asian Americans coincide with when the country has been at a low ebb. 1942, just after the US entered World War II, President Roosevelt imprisoned 120,000 people of Japanese descent, many of them children, many of them US citizens. You know, it was an effort to, misguided effort to prevent espionage. Um, 1982, sales of American-made autos sagged um, two white auto workers in Detroit using a baseball bat beat to death Vincent Chin. You know, they, they were angry at Japanese automakers, um, you know, for, for their growing dominance, but they took it out on a 27-year-old Chinese American. I think he was out celebrating, it was a bachelor party for him, and he was beaten to death. I don't think those guys, I don't think the perpetrators even went to jail. Um, September 11th, after September 11th, South Asian Americans endured racial profiling, became victims of hate crimes, wrongly linking them to terrorist acts. And so the current period, of course, is related to the pandemic. Um, and Chinese Americans or Asian Americans being blamed for causing the virus, spreading the virus, bringing the virus to America. Um, so education goes a long way to creating empathy 
Um, there's a bill in Beacon Hill to teach ethnic studies in public schools, as well as other efforts to get Asian American history as part of the K-12 curriculum. You know, I myself am learning a lot in recent months about Asian American history. Um, one fact that is stuck with me, a uh, new fact that I learned this year, um, Asian Americans were also lynched. One of the biggest mass lynchings in the United States took place in Los Angeles in 1871, when an angry mob hung 18 Chinese Americans in one day. Um, that represented about 10% of the Chinese population in the city back then. So my parents immigrated to the US in 1970. And I'm a first generation ABC, American born Chinese. That's what they call me. Um, and as such, my brother and I were taught we would never be fully accepted as Americans. You know, this is what my parents, my parents version of the talk was, um, you'll never be accepted. <laughs> uh, and you'll always be a perpetual foreigner. And so my parents attitude has been, why fight the racism? Why fight the unequal treatment? Just accept it. It's your lot in life because we have chosen to live in America. And I hope against hope my parents would be wrong. You know, and for a while I thought they might be. Um, when you see the rise of Asian Americans in politics and um, in Hollywood, um, I mean, even here in Boston with Michelle Wu running for mayor and being among, you know, a leading candidate for mayor. Um, you begin to see yourself represented. Um, and, but the resurgence of white supremacy and the pandemic's xenophobic politics changed all of that. And when the most vulnerable of the Asian American community, women and the elderly are under attack, we can no longer stay silent and accept racism. I mean, that's not an acceptable strategy anymore. And um, so after Atlanta, many of us live in fear, but that does not mean we run or we hide. It means we stand up and be heard. So I write and I speak about AAPI issues any chance I get. I call out organizations, even my own newsroom, when I think they are missing important AAPI storylines. Um, the Asian American narrative is, is not as well known as other ethnic groups. And I'm, I'm grateful I have a platform to educate and inform. Um, I'm grateful for the space uh, the Northeastern Law School has given me today. Um, I was similarly asked to speak at an API event organized by the Massachusetts Women Forum earlier this week. I think I saw uh, Representative Wynn <laughs> on the Zoom. We were both at that forum uh, speaking on the panel. And, um, and so after sharing our experiences, um, the president of the forum, Judy Habib, told us, uh, sadly, it sometimes takes a breakdown to get breakthrough, uh, a breakthrough to a new way of seeing, of thinking, of being. So I hope today I provided um, a window into what it means to be an Asian American today um, and what role you may have in allyship. Um, what we've learned from our black and uh, black sisters and brothers um, is that this fight for equal treatment is a journey, um, one that can last decades. Um, but, but this time feels different. I mean, um, I, you know, I'm not ready to say it will be different, but it can be different. Um, we have a lot of work to do, more rallies, more policy changes, more elections, and many more laws. Um, and my hope is, is, is that if we can work together and keep our focus on creating a more equitable country, um, that we can eradic eradicate the talk. <laughs> You know, my sons will never have to give their children the talk, nor will Black parents or anyone else. Um, so I thank you for this space today. Um, I think we have a few minutes for Q&A. 
Um, and I'm not sure who's doing it or am I supposed to look at the, no, the no, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll help you. First of all, okay. big round of applause for Shirley. Amazing conversation <laughs> really made us think about things. And, um, you know, we've been hearing a lot about the model minority and invisibility. And I just think that's so important. And, you know, both Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate can exist at the same time. There's much to work on. If anyone has a question and you want to put it in the chat, we'd love to hear it. If you just want to unmute yourselves and you have something you want to ask, please do. Um, we'd love to hear from you. We wanted to make this really interactive for Shirley. Take a quick photo. <laughs> from, so my fan, my base <laughs> of women lawyers. Love, your base. love following you on Twitter. Love your articles. Love seeing you on Greater Boston and other things. Does anyone have a question and want to unmute for Shirley? Don't be shy. <laughs> Trom, are you here? I, 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 I have a question. I, oh, yeah. I'll go if no one else is going to go. Oh, here's Amy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Shirley, that was fantastic. Thank you so Thank you. much. Um, I, um, I, I actually, I saw someone in the chat about renewing. I renew my subscription to the Globe because of you. Yeah. So, yeah. You, can you can um, you send me an email? Like, <laughs> let me show my boss. <laughs> I will. I'm happy to. <laughs> so anyway, it's just it's you know it's kind of a simple question, but I was just curious about how like do do you decide on the topics that you know in terms of your columns? Do you decide on the topics you write about, or do you get fed them? You know, from other editors, or you know, how how does that process work? I'm just fascinated with. Um. It, it's a combination, you know, a, a lot of it is, um, you know, I, I often come up with my own story ideas, right? Uh, but I also get pitched, you know, uh, like the, the Mass Taxpayers Foundation, you know, had approached me and said, we've got this report coming out, um, you know, do you want to take a first look at it? And knowing that I write a lot about the racial wealth gap, and so I said, absolutely. Um, you know, other times I, uh, you know, I, I, I like to pick, um, I mean, when I launch my column, I have a whole strat. I had a strategy. Like I, I, um, you know, I, I wanted it to be a, the column to be reported. You know, some people just have a pure opinion, right? But I wanted to be known for my reporting and for you know scoops or for uh, you know breaking some news in my column. Um, I actually specifically launched because I wanted to write about. Um, gender in the workplace. Specifically, I wanted to write about the lack, at the time, the lack of women on corporate boards. Because um, I felt like that was a, um, I mean, this is like, you know, seven years ago now. And so um, and when, when you know, there wasn't a lot of people writing about it. And I just felt like when, when there were news stories, um, you know, it, it didn't, when, when in a new, I felt like when you wrote about corporate boards or the lack of women on corporate boards, maybe it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't fire people up. Right. But I felt like if I did it in my column voice, if I did it my way, it would, yeah. it would get people thinking. And I remember when, um, you know, I, I just briefly, I never aspired to be a columnist. I, you know, I, I was a reporter for 10 years and then I edited for 10 years and I thought I would retire, um, you know, as an editor. Um, because I love managing people, I love you know, uh, you know, driving coverage. And when the current editor Brian McGrory, he was a longtime columnist at the Globe, and when he became editor, he's like, I want to hire another business columnist. And so I was the business editor at the time. So I like to say, so I was in charge of the search, the you know, the the national search <laughs> for a columnist, and I ended up you know, raising my own hand, uh, um, me right here, right under my nose. Uh, I like to say it was my Dick Cheney moment, right? Um, and so, and and the reason why I was thinking, you know, you, you, you can't really import someone from like Houston or Philadelphia to write about Boston. You, you the person already had to be here. And so, um, and, and, you know, the first question I was asked was, do you know, do you know how to write? I was like, I, I have no idea if I, I can remember if I can write. I And so I did some sample columns. And one of my first sample columns was about Boston, the, the corporate board of Boston Beer. That's the maker, Sam Adams. And I'd been hearing this story in the community for years about how people were kept on hounding Jim Cook 
the, the you know, co-founder to put a woman on his board. You know, he had an all male board and everybody was like in town was like women in town were like, you got to put a woman on the board. Women drink beer. Right. So he finally did. He put a woman on his board, but it was his wife. He put his wife on the board. Now, now, like as I wrote, you know, she's she's no slouch. I mean, she's no I mean, she she's, a you know, I think it was like a Harvard Business School grad. She ran her own company, but there was just something off <laughs> when you, you lack a certain amount of independence if you put your wife on the board i mean that that happens in other countries you know you know how countries other countries started to create quotas um for women on boards and that's what happened the 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 ceos ended up putting their wives on the board and so so i took him to task on this i was like this is ridiculous and so you know, that's a hard story to do as a news story, but it's a great column, right? <laughs> I mean, he's now since, I mean, years later, he does have, I, or I haven't checked recently, but he ended up putting a second woman on his board who's not his wife. Not really. um, we, hope not. <laughs> we hope not. And surely we're going to take one more question okay. from Fatima, who's had her hand raised. Okay. Uh, hi, Shirley. Um, I have a question. Um, in terms of the model minority myth, sometimes I feel like I get that from my own community, my own Asian community. So it's actually pushing back against the narrative, not from externally, but internally, especially when it came to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, where, it, uh, and it, there was a generational divide too. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, you know, if you have any observation because that that's it's really hard because it, it was like well we did it <laughs> we pulled our boat bootstraps we worked hard and I feel like there's an internal internalization of that model minority like yeah, we are the model minority and I, I I agree with the statistics and you're right but there are certain pockets of the community and also I want to I mean this is this should be obvious but the Asian community like you said is very uh, broad, um, you know, uh, somebody who's of Chinese descent or Indian descent or Pakistani, the experiences are so varied. But yeah, I was wondering if you can speak to that because it was really, really hard to have these conversations last year, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, you, you well, probably just a minute or two, if you can. Yeah, you know, I'm going to say something brief. I was going to say you've touched like a third rail. <laughs> you know, I mean, this gets talked all the time. I mean, all different ways, you know, uh, whether the Asian community is doing enough to support the Black community, whether the Black community, uh, you know, every time I write about uh, violence in, uh, you know, against Asian Americans, they always say, how, do you know how many are Black perpetrators against Asian? And so I have not engaged yet. I, but, but that is a huge issue. Um, and uh, th that, that at some point I do actually want to address because I, I do feel like our Asian community and the Black community, we both talk about this, but not publicly. And it is something that does need to be sorted out. Miel, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I know. There was so much more you could, but we're, we're doing really well. We're keeping it on track here. So if everyone would unmute and give Shirley a big round of applause, please. Yay. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for spending time with us. Um, I told you when I um, secured you that one of my colleagues, Deborah Feldman, said immediately, oh my God, you got Shirley Lunn? And I said, yes, I wore her down after a few years. So we're so privileged to have you with us today. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I'm sorry that you and your sons and your family and the AAPI community are going through so much on top of an already terrible year. Just very okay. sorry about that. So Thank you. well, we're, res we're, we're resilient. We're a resilient community. And we and I'm hoping that my story, my experiences, my stories, my anecdotes today will you know, create new allies and, and also make people think about how you can support Asian Americans in your community and within your or organization. So anyways, I got to go back on deadline. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Shirley. Bye, Shirley. Thank you.